Um, this talk, most of this talk was written yesterday and this morning, okay? So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to turn my back on it, on you a little bit to, to read what I've just written. So um, it's kind of continuous delivery of requirements, continuous delivery of presentations. I wanna talk about, uh, about five or six sort of topics this morning. Um, I'm gonna make the suggestion that Agile is transitional. We're not there yet. Continuous delivery pipelines require a trusted requirements pipeline. It's a factory process, you could say. And we can test the quality at the end, but isn't it better to test the quality at the beginning? And kind of, it's an old Japanese kind of saying, you know, the, uh, we, we have front door quality, not back door quality. I wanna talk about definition and insurance. Now you could say, well, that's analysis and testing, but I think we're changing the way we build software pretty quick. And these are the words I'm using from now on. I wanna talk about traceability achieved in flight. So to date, what has happened is testers come along and um, uh, create coverage and generate coverage after the software is built. We figure out what we test and we measure coverage as we test. But I think that's wrong. Surely we can define our coverage measures before we write the software. Certainly the black box measures. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to suggest that maybe we're coming towards the end of manual uh, feature checking. Uh, feature checking is gonna, is gonna happen, but it's gonna be done using tools, which is fantastic, because now we can release a lot of the people who are doing this manual feature checking to do more intelligent stuff. I think we'll also lose a few of the testers who cannot make that transition. So it's not good news for everybody. Okay, so uh, I think Agile is, is transitional. I think in the, you could argue in the 90s, you know, we were waterfall and the 2000s were Agile, and I think the next, this, this, this decade is one where um, continuous delivery will become uh, the big buzzword, the, the dominant approach that people are marketing. Agile has not gone away, and Agile will not go away. But I think there's a third way, and continuous is being promoted by some of the smartest guys out there in the industry. So it's not going to go away. Uh, but by and large, I'm not going to promote one um, agile method above another, you know, BDD or Accept and Test-Driven Development or Specification by Example. I tend to use Specification by Example a little bit more often nowadays. But they're all very, very closely related. TDD is a developer technique, but it's been extended into the stakeholder space. Where do testers fit in all this? Because basically a year ago, <clears throat> a lot of people were saying, you know, including Goiko, for example, were saying, you know, death to the testing phase. And I'm kind of saying the same thing, except it's not about death to the phase, it's death to manual testing, manual checking. That's what's going to be transformed, I think. Now, one interesting th I met a guy a couple of weeks ago at, at Eurostar uh, from Malaysia, and uh, he bounded over and said, Paul, I really enjoyed your talk. And it wasn't this talk, it was related, but not the same talk. And he said, I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, you know what we're doing? He said, we're behind everybody, we're still waterfall. We're not gonna go agile, we're gonna go straight to continuous. They're gonna skip it. They're not gonna transition through agile, they're gonna ignore it. They're gonna move straight to, con and I thought, good luck. But we'll see. So some people are making these decisions right now. And he was like a country coordinator for ISTQB. But I, don't think, and I thought that was kind of interesting. So that's where they see their future. So maybe there's something in this. And the, question, the question I've got, really, is the underlying question is, how do corporates implement Agile at scale? That's the big question. But what I want to talk about, really, is how do non-Agile organizations deliver systems with a continuous delivery approach? How do they do that? And I think that's just another quite way of putting the question. I mean, culturally, they have a real challenge. You have teams who want to deliver frequently in very small, uh, small pieces, small pieces of functionality, story level. That's their unit of work, if you like, a story. But corporates, bigger organizations, any complex organization, really, they don't create requirements, function, functional requirements in small quantities. They go for very big you know, big systems, if you like. How can they match these two different things? And culturally, they, they move slower. 
I don't th but I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. They don't move slower. They have a similar velocity to anybody who's agile. They, it's the quantity of requirements functionality that they require that is the problem. It takes them six months to create a document, which you may say is wrong or right or anything in between, but the complexity of what is being asked for is huge. So don't mistake um, the quality of requirements from the lack of quantity. You know, the amount of functionality they are requesting can be absolutely huge. So let me explain. Does anybody not know what continuous delivery is? Ah, oh, it, it's okay. You'll have to miss it. Martin, it's driven, being driven by some smart guys in the technology side of our industry. So Martin Fowler's one, and, and if you like, it's the programmer's frustration. I've written all my code. As far as I am concerned, it works for me. Why does it take months to deliver that code into, into production and achieve the business value, whatever that is? That's their frustration. So there's, a, there's quite, quite some movements out there in the technical community, technology kind of community, to promote this idea of continuous integration as a way, as continuous delivery, as a way of speeding up the process of delivery into into business, and that's fantastic. But the way the proposal for how that's done is is really about this notion of compressing large, larger scoped deliveries into very small scoped deliveries, repeatedly, very short timescales, weekly, daily, hourly. That's their goal. That's where they want to be. And a business is going to say, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Why would I ever not want that? They'll say, well, wait a minute, isn't this risky? And they'll think carefully before they commit to it. But it's, the demand is there for rapid delivery and continuous delivery. The demand is there. The problem we have as an industry is, how do we achieve that without screwing up too badly? So one of the aspects of continuous delivery is this idea of a pipeline. And it's a bit like a production line, except it's a very high-speed kind of production line, you could, you could say. And a lot of the activities in there, apart from the coding of the application itself, a lot of these activities are automated. The builds are automated, the integration automated, the, uh, certainly the unit testing is automated. Maybe acceptance testing is automated. Everything's automated, fantastic. So all we need to do is press a button, and the build, the automation takes over, and deployed into a test environment or a production environment. But let's not mistake continuous deployment with going live all the time. There's a lot of uh, businesses out there who are deploying very regularly, but not committing to uh, re revealing that functionality to end users out there in the, in the cloud, if you like. So there's a lot of um, kind of, if you like, dark releases is one way of, one way of, of doing this, where you might release 30 times in a month, but only at the end of the month you actually release it to people to actually use, to end users to actually use. And there's lots of ways of juggling this, this way of, of, of working. So, I need a drink. If we have this notion of continuous delivery into an environment, we also have this notion of release, not release of the software, but re revelation of the software to end users, okay? So clearly this is kind of the cloud-based stuff, I, I appreciate that. So you get that idea, so that's kind of simple. But I want to argue, this is one of my theses, it's not about automation, it's about trust. Uh, yeah, we're in Germany right now, okay, and SAP is a huge, SAP is an industry in its own right. One of the tenets of, of SAP is this concept of straight through processing. What you do is, if you put very high quality data at the start of an SAP process, you will get very high quality output at the end of that process. And the process itself is very reliable. But that very reliable process depends on very high quality data going into it. And it's the same idea with continuous delivery. It has to be. There's no point in releasing three times a day and then two of those releases are patches to fix bugs you've discovered a couple of hours afterwards. There's no value in that. That doesn't move us forward. So, the, so the, the basis of continuous delivery is a continuous pipeline of high quality requirements. Okay? So, where does this lead us? Sorry, I have to look at what I have written here. 
if a requirement drives today's delivery, it must be trusted. That's reasonable, isn't it? If we're doing a release today based on a requirement we uh, discovered yesterday, surely we have to trust it. Otherwise, we're going to get ourselves into big trouble. Isn't that obvious? So kind of, we're, we're not looking at perfect requirements. Don't get me wrong. Okay? There will not be time to perfect all these requirements. But what we must be comfortable with is, at this moment in time, to the best of our knowledge, this requirement, we can trust it's mature enough, it's coherent, it's, uh, we understand what we're trying to achieve here, we're ready to build something against it. Now, what those criteria are, you might define for yourself. But, you, but this idea of trust, I think, is, is the word to use. We trust that we're not going to screw up, because we're going to press this button, and stuff is going to happen, and we're going to cause a lot of damage, or achieve what we want to achieve. It's kind of a high-risk option. So we have to trust it, but not perfect it. So OK, I want to talk about bringing business analysis and testing together. So this is one of my bugbears. Why, oh, why, oh, why did we separate testing from one end of a project from the guys who defined the things we're testing at the other end? How did we get here? I, I don't know. I, I, I honestly I have no explanation for that. It's, it's, it's just plain wrong, in my opinion. We define what we want, but we don't think about how we will recognize achievement of that goal. How stupid is that? So, you know, I want a car, but I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to recognize a good car. We're only giving half the information required to developers to build stuff. They only have half the specification, you could say. And testers, who have a huge amount to contribute up front, are not involved a lot of the time. And what Agile has taught us is the one good thing, I say the one good thing, there's many good things about Agile. One good thing about Agile is we've closed the gap so that we have continuous feedback within our teams. So the people whose role it is to define a requirement and the people whose role it is to test the software against that requirement may be the same person. They may be sitting on desks next to each other. They certainly talk every day. So we've brought these two sides together. And I would call this definition assurance. I, I'm, not, I'm not inventing terms. You know, the definition of what we want and the assurance that we get what we want, these two things should be you know, like that. Okay? So with continuous delivery, it's inevitable that definition and assurance must be together. You have no choice. So whoever you are as a tester, you need to be very, very close indeed to the people who are defining the requirements for the software. Or you might be that person. Okay, that's a possibility. So, OK, wait a minute. One of my other theories is there's no such thing as um, structured requirements analysis. I think requirements analysis, the gathering, the elicitation, the, the pulling together into business rules, that is an agile activity because it's iterative, it's incremental. Okay? It depends on people and communication. So analysis is an agile activity. It's just not called that. Okay? So it's very natural to merge agile analysis and agile testing or agile assurance. And, and, and the reason I say this is, is when, when a, an analyst visits a, a user and says, OK, Mr. User, tell me what you want, what does that user do? They don't, they don't spout business rules and formulae, they basically tell stories. And what happens is when they tell those stories, the analyst gathers many stories from different stakeholders and looks for patterns and, and combinations and then derives a set of business rules based on those stories. And then, then those business rules are published as a requirement and the stories are thrown away. That's what happens. All this gold dust that is captured in these, in these interactions between analysts and users are thrown away. Now, what Agile has picked up on is, wait a minute, let's not go down the path of creating business rules. Let us, let us capture those stories and use them directly. Now, the problem with a story is they give concrete examples of a system in use. They don't generalize what the requirement is, and that's what a requirement should be doing. Okay? So my proposal is, when analysts or product owners or whoever is, is gathering the, the source, you know, using the source of knowledge to define 
what the system should do, they capture both stories and requirements. And they use those stories to validate the requirements, the business rules. So my argument is that we need both. Um, it's a distraction, but, and I can't really do it now, but uh, I think logically you need both the business rules and you need examples. You can't have one without the other. It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so, defo spam. Look it up on Google, okay? It's a method, a technique for generating stories from requirements, okay? That's all it is, okay? I'm not, I haven't got time to talk about it right now. So there's a method out there you could pick up and use, okay? It's free. How many scenarios do we create for a, st for a story? And this is kind of a big question, and I'm not gonna, I haven't got an answer for this, except to say that the generation of scenarios against uh, stories to describe the behavior of features in concrete examples, okay, that, that process has several different objectives. And if we can focus on those objectives, then we know perhaps a little bit better where we're at. So one objective might be, do we understand the scope of this feature? Do we know, you know that, what the limitations, what the boundaries are that we're working within? And only two or three stories might, uh, two or three examples might be required to do that. But to get a stakeholder to accept this feature, we might have to create a few more scenarios. We might have to create a table of, of scenarios for them to recognize that I think everything I'm concerned about is delivered and works. But wait a minute, how many scenarios do I need to validate the requirement? Who can say? Only the people, you know, in the collaborating collaborating team will recognize that moment. What about to estimate the work to build this feature? When you get down to scenario level, it becomes much easier for a, for a developer, and I'm a developer, to understand what is to be created. It's, estimation is a bottom-up process, okay? But we need, to, we need some information. How many stories does it take? How, how many scenarios does it take to, to do a good estimate? I don't know, only your developers can tell you. How about the system testers? How many scenarios would they, would they create to test that feature in a system test? Okay, well, they can use their techniques and models to, to, to come up with coverage targets, stuff like that. Only they can tell you. To unit test, yeah, how many scenarios does a developer need to unit test a feature? Again, the developers have to work these things out. Or you need to work with them to set a policy for them to follow. But scenarios, scenario creation is about several goals. They're not conflicting, they're kind of layered just like testing, okay? So what I want to argue now is one of the big tester things is traceability. We love traceability. We love the concept of saying, well, here's a requirement, and I've created some test cases, and by the way, I'm, when I say requirement, I don't care whether it's a requirement or a story, it's a source of knowledge. That's all it is, it's just a label, okay? So when I have a requirement, it's nice to think that I've created tests that exercise aspects of that functionality in a way that has meaning to stakeholders. The stakeholder might be me if I'm a developer. The stakeholder might be uh, my test manager, my, my users, my uh, overall owner of the program. I have different stakeholders. But the concept of traceability is critical because then the question, how was this feature tested? How was this requirement tested? How was this goal demonstrated? Right now, most coverage is achieved retrospectively. Now that is so backward, and the reason it is is because we put test after the definition. We put assurance after definition. So what I want to suggest is one way of looking at these things, and I'm showing some, uh, I couldn't draw this, okay? Well, I could. But one of the things I had to do yesterday is knock some slides up in a hurry, so I've taken some screenshots of a tool we're building. I'm not selling you a tool, I'm just being lazy. It was easier to do screenshots than it was to draw diagrams. But a network of goals, starting, this is looking bottom up, just because I wanted to fit it on the page. I've got a series of goals. These oval shapes are goals. And in any business program, there are a whole collection of goals which are interdependent. It's a goal network. It's not sequential. It's a network. And every goal may have Risks associated. Again, there's only three or four risks on the diagram, but there are potentially many risks. And what this diagram does is it shows progress through a network of goals to some ultimate business goal. And this example is a, a, new, a new game on the National Lottery. Okay? Some of these goals are business goals. They don't involve IT at all. 
Some of them involve IT. You cannot take IT in isolation in a business project. There are no such things as IT projects. There are only business projects. Okay? So what we can do, if you imagine this on its side, there is stuff that is complete, some green stuff, and then the stuff that's in progress, amber, whatever, and then you've got lots of gray stuff. It's just, well, what is it? It's just a storyboard on its side. Except these are very high-level goals. A requirement is a ton of text. So a requirement is a ton of text that does definition of some business rules. Uh, here's a trivial one. Well, it's not so trivial, actually, but uh, a calculator. Two numbers and an operator give me a result. Add, subtract, divide, multiply. Those are some requirements. I don't care whether you think these requirements are good or bad or detailed or not detailed or whatever, okay? There's a definition of a need there in terms of business rules. Now, some of the language, some of the words is color-coded because we've highlighted the words that we have placed great criticality on, great assurance on, because we need to have very clear definitions. So there's an index, a glossary of terms, which defines these terms, and those terms have a, de have a status. Some of them are greed, some of them are in process, some of them have not been defined yet. Okay, that's all that is. If you imagine scrolling up, it went sideways, but it should go up. Okay. This is the end of the requirement. This is a story. As a, an ordinary user of the system, I want to perform a calculation so I achieve a numerical result, whatever. Interesting, calculation, numerical results are defined terms. We have a scenario. It's not a very good uh, point to this. Given when then. Stuff in green are defined terms, language that business understand. The blue, the blue elements are data items. Crikey, we're defining a data dictionary here, aren't we? And these are some examples associated with that scenario. So we've kind of gone from the requirement, identifying a feature, some scenarios. Now we can use the content of this table of examples to go back to our users and say, is this what you mean? Is this what you want? Do I understand this requirement correctly? This is a rather too elaborate way. I mean, we wouldn't, you wouldn't use as many as this probably in, in reality, but you get the idea. Scrolling up the page a bit further, we have the index. These are the keywords, the defined terms that are used in this requirement. And of course, all the requirements have this index associated. So we know exactly what terminology has been used in exactly which requirements and which feature descriptions and in which scenarios. So we're beginning to emerge, uh, we're, be we're beginning to have uh, a ubiquitous language emerge, which we cannot get. You cannot build a ubiquitous language at the end of a project. You've got to build it as you create the content, the knowledge that you're going to use to build software. So we've got the usual thing, the requirements hierarchy, but there's also a hierarchy of uh, requirement, requirement, feature, scenarios, and a table of examples for that scenario. You get the idea, okay? This is how we must think. This all has to be in place before we write a line of code. Now, that's not strictly true, but it's helpful if it is. Because if the developers want to do test-driven development, these are their tests. Why can't the developer create these tests for their test-driven stuff? It's an iterative idea. Uh, I think I said that. OK, so where are we now? We have this hierarchy, and we have this notion of business goals against which requirements can be associated. OK, so it starts with goals, then requirements, features, scenarios, examples. We have this hierarchy. So if an example becomes a concrete test later on, we can trace back at any level. We can report against our business goals. And actually, our stakeholders aren't interested in any of the test reporting we do. All they ever want to know is, how far away am I from my business goal? And what risks exist? And what progress are we making to address those risks? That's all they really want. That's the senior guy. But at various levels, we can report at any level. That's the idea. We're building traceability as we go. We're not attempting to do it at the end. That's the point. That's hard. It's also inaccurate. So um, is it the end of manual feature testing? Um, not testing, checking. In principle, we've known for years 
that if we can specify our test using some natural language and the BDD of the behavior driven guys and the gherkin and cucumber and things like that have demonstrated that it is possible to capture text that describes the behavior of features and use that to drive test automation. We know how to do this. This is not new. What's new is, is attempting to create this traceability before the event, not after the event, and to relate features back up to key requirements and business goals and risks. So I'm proposing that it, it is possible for testers working with stories to create the checks and never run them manually. Because we could run, let the tools run the checks, let us then focus our in intellect and our intelligence on the exploratory testing of those features when they're available. Isn't that what we should be doing? We shouldn't be asking people to do manual checking. Okay? There's a lot of people out there doing it, but that's not what people are good at. Okay? So, if we capture our stories and scenarios in a structured format, you know, the Gherkin format, if you like, we can export test automation code, test harness code, if you like, in any format you like. It becomes a report. It's easy. All we need is a template and to be told which language we need to worry about, and we can generate a report to that, that generates a Python unit test or a C++ or Java. We can generate Cucumber or Fitness. Or, you know, it's endless. My personal preference is to generate unit test framework code and something like robot framework code. Yeah, you know, for a web page, for a website. Why don't we just generate it? Why do we write it? It's keywords. That's all it is. The other thing is, it's possible to connect to proprietary tools, but the proprietary tool vendors don't particularly want you to do this. Because if we, if we have this kind of tool available, they will sell fewer licenses. Because we don't need as many. That's not strictly two again, because it might be we're actually swapping manual testers for test automation, but you see where I'm coming from. It's, it's, it's less cumbersome. It's less bureaucratic. We're using the tools as robots, not as sophisticated products, which is what we're trying to do now and having a lot of difficulty. So uh, story-based checks, in principle, should be automated for life. OK. So what can I talk about traceability and impact analysis? The benefit of traceability, to me, is not really about how we demonstrate that we've um, exercised some functionality sufficient to show that it works or doesn't work. Okay? That's fantastic. But that's not, actually, that's not the most important thing. The best thing about traceability is when it comes to release number two, or release number three, or release number 300. Because if we have that traceability, and we trust our requirements, and we trust our feature definitions, and we trust our tests because they are 100% automated, we can use that as a source of knowledge for impact analysis. So we have this kind of hierarchy, you know, and it's all the traceability is there, and you think that's fantastic, lovely, lovely, lovely. And I've, this is a duplicate slide, of course. With continuous delivery, these artifacts are in synchronization. They align with each other. So what we can now do is, when the question is asked, suppose I change this feature. Which requirements are affected? Well, we know straight away. Which tests are affected? Well, we know that too. Suppose the question asked is, well, we'd like to increase the size of our customer ID field from six digits to nine digits. Now, normally, that is a complete nightmare for most organizations. And the user says, it's a simple requirement. What's the problem? The developers throw their hands up in horror <clears throat> and say, this is an absolute nightmare, but they can't put their finger on it. <clears throat> Sorry. They can't, they can't articulate what the risk of change is. But wait a minute. If we capture the ubiquitous language in our dictionary and the, the keywords that we use in our requirements and our stories and our features and our scenarios are aligned, we can answer the question, if I change this field, I know which tests, I know which features, I know which requirements, I know which business goals are affected. Now, we've never been able to do that because we've never trusted our requirements, our sources of knowledge. So that's where I'm trying to come up from with this. 
the benefits of having this traceability, it's not just a bureaucratic, bureaucratic exercise. It's our independent source of knowledge for the behavior of our systems. Now, we can rely on programmers to do this uh, impact analysis, technically impact analysis, but it's a mighty difficult thing to do well. It's incredibly hard. You know? You know why, do why do we have these huge regression tests in the first place? Because it's incredibly hard, hard to predict the impact of change in our software systems. So what I'm trying to suggest we can do is we move the emphasis from um, detection at the end to prevention at the beginning. Now, one of the, um, I have a friend who uh, is a, well, he was a consultant, uh, project manager, and he told me he doesn't do project management anymore. He helps people to manage their project portfolio. And he said, essentially, my job is to sort of go in, look at the 100 projects they've got in their portfolio that are in various stages, and tell them which ones to kill. And that's it. If we can do better impact analysis, the essence of lean is not to start crappy projects in the first place. You know, we, it's not about saving a percent here and a percent there. It's about let us not embark on foolish enterprises. That's what we should be aiming at. So I would suggest that Lean starts with choosing the right projects to build in the first place. That's where it starts. So I've run ahead of time. This is incredible. Summary. What do I have to, what do I have to say? I've got a series of kind of little snapshots to just point, point towards. And the first one is um, agile business analysis, which I think is a tautology. All business analysis is agile, I think. And testing become one. I don't know if it's the same person, whatever, but they become a unit, an inseparable part of our projects. We don't have them six months apart anymore. We don't have them in different buildings. We don't have them in different, different continents. We have them in the same heads or in the same group or the same team or the same, same pod. Okay? Test strategy and requirements are part of business analysis. Now, this is terrifying. You know, we're giving away all the stuff, all our, in, all our, all our kind of strategic thinking you know, to, to the business analysts. No, we're not. We're just trying to put it in the right place. That's all we're trying to do. Requirements pipeline and tests are goal and risk-based. How does a corporate feed its 10,000 stories into teams that can only deal with two or three stories a day? How do they do that? It's got to be goal and risk-based. Every, if we understand the relationship between business goals and requirements and stories and features, we understand what the important stuff is. If we understand the notion of risk associated with these relationships, we also understand where we need to put most of the testing. You cannot separate the definition of a requirement from its assurance. It's a foolish thing to do. You can do it, but it's a foolish thing to do. And the other thing is, sorry, one last thing, is, is we don't test to find bugs. I'm sick of hearing people say that. It's, that's so 80s. It, it's, it's not about bugs. Bugs are a consequence of doing what we're really doing, which is addressing risk and measuring achievement. That's what we're doing. Testers work closer with BAs or become one. It's a choice. I think we have that choice. I think there's a great opportunity to do this kind of stuff now. You know, I mean, for those guys who think, oh, there's no future in testing, you become a tester, maybe a lead tester, test manager, and then you resign because you, you hit a ceiling. I think it, there's much more to be done for us. I think we are such knowledgeable people that we have a better insight as to the status of our projects than anyone else on our projects. Isn't that the case? We know weeks before the senior guys that this project is never going to deliver. Don't we know that? We also know that it is going to deliver because we got the data. And we should bring that knowledge and intelligence up front to the people who need it most, which are the senior stakeholders. It's a fantastic opportunity. Agile governance comes naturally. So agile governance is a, another one of these buzzwords that, that is a big concern for you know, corporates who think, well, I want to, to go agile, but I'm worried about governance. If you have the traceability, and if you have some form of project iteration management that is visible to the senior guys, and you have a notion of change history, you know how you got where you got. You can track back and say, how did we get to this position? 
you've kind of got governance. So it's not a huge ambition to, to implement agile governance, in my opinion. It's, it's within reach. And this is my kind of closing slide. Now, I started with this notion of continuous deliveries being promoted by the techies. If they get what they want, and we do what we think is possible, business analysts and testers control the behavior of developers. They are our slaves. And isn't that the way it should be? Don't get me wrong, I, these are very smart, intelligent people. Don't, I, it's not about you know, uh, being aggressive towards these guys and whipping them and you know, treating them harshly. But they are doing a job that should not, um, as individuals, have such huge influence on the outcome of our projects. You know, if they screw up, we are in big trouble. They need support. Now, the other angle that corporates come at this from is, we all might think we work in small teams, and we, and we love working in our small team. We're a really tight, tight bunch. We get on socially. We talk constantly. We make progress every day. It's fantastic working in our small team. Now, a corporate would say, well, that's lovely. But we're building much bigger systems than a small team can deliver. They want, essentially, to treat aspects of our business as commodities. They've done it with a lot of uh, manual checking. And huge offshore teams do mountains of, of uh, manual checking. I think a lot of that is under threat. OK, so what? But with developers, perhaps if I can define what I require in terms that are not negotiable, I am then going to seek the cheapest price for that activity. That's, what, that's the way corporates think. Because it's, it's about, they want simplicity, and they want economy. And if you can separate the activity of your analysis, analysts and testers, the definition assurance from the delivery of code, and you can imagine that that can be managed and controlled by us providing accurate requirements, non-negotiable scenarios for them to work with, we can treat that activity as a commodity. And therefore, it's based on price. So they're under huge pressure. If they get what they want, they're in trouble. Look out. I'm done. OK, that's me. So uh, two things to say. I'm, I apologize, but I don't apologize for using some screenshots for the tool. We're building a product. I'm not selling you the product, but that's what I am working on full time right now. The thinking is in a little book here, which you can download for free as well, uh, with that link, businessstorymethod.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions? Good. Oh. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree more that uh, business analysts and testers should work together. But how do you want to <coughs> Sorry. make those uh, business analysts and testers cooperate, especially on the business analyst side? Uh, to make them cooperate? Well, I, I wouldn't want to make anybody do anything. I mean, it, I, I think you basically um, open a door for them to walk into. And I think the argument that uh, we shouldn't separate business analysts and testers is supported by the fact that um, well, we, we run, we run uh, a a test managers forum in the UK. We run quarterly events for test managers. And every now and then you get to meet a tester who says, oh, woe is me, I'm never involved early enough, no one takes any notice of what I do, my estimates are just reduced arbitrarily. And then we talk to BAs. We're going to run a BA forum in the UK because we believe what we're saying here. We believe this is the way to go. So we're creating a BA forum, and we invited about 20 uh, business analysts together to get them in a room and say, well, what are the issues in business analysis? And what did they say? We are never given enough time. No one treats us seriously. We don't get enough attention. The things we produce are not valued. We don't have enough time to change them and make them correct and perfect them. They're ignored. All the same complaints that we get from testers who are suffering it's just the same in business analysis. We have a huge ally there. And I think we're not in competition with them. We just should collaborate much more closely with them. Now, of course, if you get two people doing a job more effectively, well, maybe one, one guy's got to go. 
I, I don't know, I can't say that. But, but I don't think it's a difficult, it should not be a difficult task to get people to work more closely together and saying one of the properties of Agile that is, is supreme is rapid feedback. And the best way to get rapid feedback between the definition and assurance of what we, what we want out of software is to put those guys in the same room, to put them in the same team, to put them closer together physically. I don't think it's a difficult one to do. If it's not possible to put someone physically close? I'll give you a book, by the way, because that's the whole point. If it's not possible. Um, well, OK, I guess we use tools. You know, I mean, how do you do that anyway? How do you work with remote locations? All the tools we've got now, we just have to work them a bit harder. You know, so whether it's video conferencing or conference calls or you know, shared whiteboards or you know, whatever. I think these are the things that we have to do. I would also promote that we have to have a common source of knowledge for our requirements and our testing. And that's why we're building a product. It, it seems to me it's the only way to go. And it's not it's just a, a, a little bit of a, as an aside. It's one of the reasons that we are not getting out of testing, but we're moving our attention away from testing and more towards business analysis. Is because I think there's going to be a lot fewer testers in the future. It's a really tough place to be a service company, because uh, people will treat testing as a commodity, the checking, and then the uh, the uh, uh, exploratory testers will be craftsmen. You know, be, that will be a smaller kind of business, I think. So we're getting out of testing services, really. Shock question here. I can't see these bloody lights. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you have some practical recommendations for delivering uh, requirements that span across several iterations. Uh, my problem is we got weekly iterations, and we do continuous integration and continuous delivery. But we do have some requirements that span across two or three uh, iterations. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is you don't want some changes uh, to be seen by the end users until the whole requirement has been delivered. Mm -hmm. And we ended up having things like a feature toggle, uh, which creates another problem because you can have like a very yeah. huge list of feature toggles, which someone can switch on accidentally. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any recommendations that you can give. Um, there are several. There are several ways you can release software into production, whatever that, whatever that means, where you don't reveal that functionality to end users. So one concept is this concept of dark releases. You just don't tell people. It's there, but you don't make it visible. Okay? It can be tested in production in an environment that is kind of, ooh, it's in production, I can test this. Now, that's terrifyingly scary, but actually not. If you plan it right, it's not so scary. Now, so that's sometimes possible. Where you have heavily integrated um, products, that if you change one thing, you have 25 other features that you've got to correct, and it's a major change when you do the release. You have no choice but to release that into a test environment and test it, and do a do a, 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 a big release. I mean, that's just the way of software. That's just the way software is. Not every. It's a bit like eating an elephant. You can't just take slices off an elephant. If occasionally you hit a bit of bone, and then you think, crikey, this is a big lump. We can't just slice this anymore. You've got to go back to what works for you, which is a, probably a major release and a, and a significant amount of work to do the testing and integration and then, and then delivery. So uh, it, it, continuous delivery isn't for every requirement, I think I would argue. And it just, it's, it's, is it what about legacy stuff? Oh, they can't move this away, can they? Well, they don't need to. The thing about legacy code is usually it's pretty well understood. All the banks are releasing software every day, maybe many times a day. They're doing continuous delivery of patches. So they have a mechanism for doing continuous delivery. They just don't call it that. And they, they don't drive it through requirements. They drive it through bug fixes. So in principle, you know, mainframe sites can do this kind of stuff. But I, yeah, I, I haven't got an answer directly. I can't. I can't give you a specific answer. Uh, your techies have to use their brains, I think, which is a good thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.